Hello and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Memo's Weekly Review with me, Nassim Ahmed, and our regular guest, Moin Rabbani. Thanks for joining us, Moin. Thank you for having me, Nassim. It's good to be with you again. As usual, we have a packed show. Uh, we will be discussing Israel's kill zones in Gaza. Reports that Israel has created kill zones and anyone that enters that zone is automatically killed and assassinated. Uh, the deputy chief of Palestinian uh, Hamas movement has said that Israel has failed to achieve any of its objective. Israel admits it may, no, it may not be able to destroy Hamas and as a result of U.S. turning its back. As, um, and and up, you know, a, a change and development which many of us have not anticipated uh, is that Israel is considering supplying Palestinian tribes in Gaza with weapons in order to create an alternative rule um, from Hamas. Uh, I'd like to get more insults on that. And the ICJ considers Israel to be in violation of its earlier order from 26 January and as a result has modified its um, provisional measures. We'll be discussing that as well. Uh, President Biden quietly reverses the sanctions he placed uh, last month on seven individual settlers. Uh, how toothless is the US, we'll be asking. And UK government lawyers say Israel is now breaking international law. Uh, but to begin with, Moin, um, I'd like to first get your thoughts on what you think are some of the key stories from last week and share your thoughts on that, please. Well, I think the key developments in the last week, um, there was one um, in the Gaza Strip. Um, one in the region and one globally, uh, and we'll be talking about those, but just very briefly, um, we are now uh, receiving horrific reports from Al Shifa Hospital, um, the main medical complex in the Gaza Strip, which um, Israel has withdrawn from last night after spending two weeks there. And um, all everyone who has been there has said that that hospital for all intents and purposes no longer exists that it has been systematically destroyed and put out of commission there are horrific reports of dozens perhaps hundreds of bodies strewn about of of um, people who have been summarily executed um, which can be inferred because their hands were tied behind their back or blindfolded body parts strewn about the place um, uh, patients um, who have been so neglected that they have developed lice and worms eating at their open wounds uh, and so on. And, um, you know, these are the kinds of, of, of um, uh, conduct that one associates very much um, with the kinds of things that we saw in warfare during the last century, um, to put it very bluntly. Um, and it's very clear, I think, that Israel, its um, its protestations that it had to go in and take out a Hamas command center, which it claimed to have taken out um, a few months ago, um, which was then proven never to exist, is really out to systematically dismantle the civilian infrastructure of uh, of the Gaza Strip and to make it unfit for human habitation, to make social cohesion, to make basic services impossible uh, within the Gaza Strip. Regionally, and I'll try to be brief, we're seeing a um, clear escalation of um, uh, Israeli attacks uh, throughout the region, particularly in Lebanon and now also in Syria. There appears to have been a, a bombing Monday morning of a um, uh, building right adjacent to the Iranian embassy in Damascus. Uh, Israeli jets are hitting deeper and deeper um, uh, into Lebanon. And I think it's a foregone conclusion that we are going to see um, a more general outbreak of, uh, of hostilities between um, uh, Israel and Lebanon. It's just a question of, um, of, of when and how and what its regional repercussions uh, will be. Um, and globally, and, and I'll just mention it because I know we're going to discuss it, there was the U.S., um, sorry, there was the passage of a Security Council resolutions 
resolution demanding an immediate ceasefire and uh, demanding uh, the immediate release of all captives. Um, and at the same time, um, uh, U.S. Um, campaign uh, to falsely claim that somehow this uh, resolution is meaningless and not binding, effectively giving Israel a green light um, to violate that resolution in pure daylight. We will be delving, as you said, um, much deeper into those uh, two issues. Um, your first one uh, on Shifa Hospital, um, again, underscores the horror and the level of brutality that's been inflicted on the Palestinians. And, and, and one story that came out just recently is, uh, again, demonstrating the horror and the um, absolute disregard for human lives that's um we are seeing in Gaza is the kill zones that have been set up by Israel. Over the last couple of weeks, we've seen a number of images, really shocking images of Palestinians walking along Gaza and being, you know, bombed by, you know, uh, as they're walking. And, and those shocking images have been dis um, shown by Al Jazeera and viewed many, many times. And now, we know why that's the case. These are unarmed Palestinians walking along the debris in Gaza. They don't seem to be armed. They are in civilian clothes. Um, and those images, uh, again, underscore the level of brutality. But more importantly, in this case, it shows that there is a policy, stated policy in Israel now, to kill anyone that enters a particular zone known as kill zones, which is why the four Palestinians were killed in the manner that they were. And also, I think it goes back to earlier stories about the Israeli hostages who were killed as they were waving a flag. Again, I think Israel deemed those Israelis to be in a kill zone and therefore uh, shot and killed them on site. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, all of Gaza is a kill zone. You don't kill 32,000 people and decimate a whole civilian population without it being a kill zone. But that just adds to the level of brutality uh, that we are seeing on our screen every single day. Uh, so how did you respond to the uh, report about kill zones being introduced in Gaza? Well, I, I really think the only surprise is that it's now been officially confirmed um, by Israeli officers uh, speaking um, to the Israeli media. You mentioned the incident uh, some months ago of the um, three Israeli captives who managed uh, to escape and were summarily gunned down by Israeli um, uh, snipers. And we were later um, told to believe that this was a violation of Israeli uh, open fire regulations. We now, of course, know that it was an implementation of those regulations. And, and in addition to um, uh, the shocking images that you described of um, the four unarmed uh, Palestinian civilians who were taken out by a missile, a drone, or a helicopter, I'm not sure, while they were walking. And then a second strike on a clearly um, uh, wounded survivor of that first strike. There was that. And then there was also more recently another image of two Palestinian civilians waving white flags and being uh, summarily executed uh, by Israeli um, uh, snipers. This is somehow a little reminiscent also of what were called free fire zones in Vietnam during the American war in Southeast Asia, which is, um, you know, anything that moves is, is a, a legitimate target. The second point I would make is that obviously um, deliberately murdering um, uh, individuals or groups who can clearly be ascertained to be unarmed non-combatants um, is a brazen violation uh, of, of, of the laws of war. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. But above and beyond that, Israel is in, um, in practice only informing itself of the boundaries of these uh, kill zones. In other words, um, Palestinians have no way of knowing whether they are entering within or e exiting um, uh, these kill zones. And that leads one to conclude 
um, that you know there is a policy, um, not only of 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 creating let's say um, uh, sterile zones, but almost you could say of drawing people into them so that they can be killed because Israel is not making any effort um, to inform those who are potentially uh, who are putting their lives at risk that they are entering um, uh, an area in which there is a shoot to kill policy. So those kill zones, uh, let's also keep in mind that they are the latest in the way Israel targets Palestinians. At the beginning of this genocidal war, um, Israel introduced AI to generate targets. Mm -hmm. um, so that just shows how automated uh, this whole process of killing Palestinians has become in the Gaza Strip. And as you mentioned, Palestinians are not aware of these zones. They could easily, you know, find themselves uh, obliviously walking into those zones uh, and be shot and killed. And it just sh shows again the, 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 the level of the dehumanization that's, um, that's taking place. Uh, and we, of course, know the um, humanitarian situation. It's, uh, it's really bleak. And, um, and Gaza, in many ways, is facing anarchy. And uh, you know breakdown of a civil border, um, according to a number of reports. And one of the things Israel is doing in response is to um, arm Palestinian um, Palestinian families, tribes who are in opposition to Hamas. And that's something uh, I've never anticipated. Maybe. You have and others have. Um, but if there is no Palestinian authority, no UNRWA, uh, no Hamas, uh, no international body, I mean, the idea that these families and these tribes can take over and are being armed by Israel, as is reported, it sounds quite shocking. And um, I mean, how did you find, find that uh, report? Yes, it's it's a very orientalist approach that you know you you find the big chief, uh, you give him guns, and then all his followers will do exactly what he says. It doesn't quite work that way. But a little background first: um, you have a police force in the Gaza Strip, which of course operates under the authority of the government, um, which um, uh, Israel considers a legitimate target, let's not forget that Operation Cast Lead in 2008 commenced with a mass aerial bombardment of um, uh, police graduation ceremonies that killed, I think, something along the lines of 350 police officers within the space of minutes. And Israel says, you know, these are all Hamas because, of course, anything and everything is Hamas. Even the United States, Israel's chief sponsor, and weapon supplier has said that this police force, while it of course operates under the control of the Gaza government and um, uh, includes um, uh, members of Hamas, is not part of the Hamas military force and that it also includes um, uh, officers who are either affiliated with the Palestinian Authority or affiliated only with the police force and don't have any um, uh, political loyalties to one movement um, uh, or the other. So Israel has been systematically um, targeting the police force, which had been playing a reasonably effective role in um, uh, ensuring the secure and safe distribution of what little aid was getting into the Gaza Strip. Um, the purpose was to create anarchy. The purpose was to make government uh, impossible. and given what we were just discussing about Shifa Hospital, Israel, in fact, at the outset of its operation, went in and assassinated um, a, a police officer in Shifa Hospital who was responsible for coordinating the secure uh, distribution of aid in the Northern Gaza Strip. Then you have this issue of... Um, uh, of so-called tribes, I think families or, or clans or extended families is perhaps um, a, a better description, but be that as it may, this idea that these are monolithic units who can be controlled um, by one powerful chief and can therefore um, 
be put on this or that side of the political equation or instrumentalized to implement this or that policy is absolute nonsense. Anywhere in Palestine where you have a large family, um, a clan, a tribe, whatever you want to call it, you will have members who take um, different perspectives on, on, on issues. So most large families in the Gaza Strip will have members who are loyal to Hamas, members who are loyal to Fatah, members who are perhaps involved in the Islamic Jihad or the Popular Front, members who um, vote for none of the above. So these are not quite the cohesive units um, uh, that they're made out to be. Nevertheless, um, there was a um, assembly of leaders of these clans um, uh, some weeks ago in which they put out a collective statement that they reject any cooperation with the Israeli occupation. Well, they're not being armed by Israel. They're being targeted um, uh, by Israel. I think what's, what's really going on here, as you mentioned, um, Israel rejects governance by Hamas. Israel rejects governance by the Palestinian Authority. Israel rejects governance um, or aid delivery by UNRWA, which is the only international organization capable of doing this in a meaningful manner. Israel rejects everything. And it's not doing this because it has this um, uh, nonsensical idea that um, uh, governance and, and, and organized delivery of aid can be done by these clans. What Israel is really after is similar to what it did in Shifa. It is a deliberate strategy to create total and absolute chaos. It doesn't want pro-Israeli governance. It wants no governance. Um, it wants a situation in which there is chaos and anarchy, where society disintegrates, um, where um, uh, lawlessness uh, prevails and where the Gaza Strip becomes not only physically, but also institutionally um, and administratively unfit for human habitation. And what you just mentioned clearly speaks to the fact that is that the campaign in Gaza has really been all about revenge and there's never, and there's no consideration of what comes after. And that's Partly borne out. Sorry, by if I can interrupt you, I, I I think there's not consideration of what comes after because the strategy is to make sure nothing comes after. It's it's not trying to find the right formula that suits both Israel and the United States. I think it's pretty clear now that Israel's objective is to make sure nothing comes after. So yes, and, and what I was getting to is, uh, is the fact that Israel itself is recognizing the fact that it may not be able to destroy Hamas, uh, especially, uh, it complained last week, especially given that the US has said that um, there is a red line. I don't know if that's true or not, but Rafa seems to be a red line. Uh, we'll see if that is the case. Uh, and, but I wanted to get your thoughts on a, a comment related to that by the um, Hamas's um uh, Deputy Chief uh, Khalil al Haya, he gave an interview last week and he said that Israel has failed to achieve any of its objective. And he went on to say that despite Israel's claim of being a democratic entity, its aggression on Gaza has exposed the real face of this ugly and criminal regime and rogue nature of Israel has been revealed to the entire world. Now, that part of that quote cannot be disputed. Israel, in the eyes of Everyone is a prior state, uh, what, what eyes of majority, I would say. Uh, Israel's Israel's uh, support in the US has plummeted. So in that regard, of course, Israel has not achieved any of its goals. I mean, but would you generally concur with uh, Khalil's assessment that Israel has failed to achieve any of its stated aims and objectives? Well, I think... Quite clearly, after half a year of, 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 of relentless, intensive uh, warfare, um, I'm, I'm certain that Hamas has been degraded. I'm sure that Hamas um, has suffered uh, significant um, uh, losses. And I think, you know, that the idea that it is standing as, as, as strong today as it did on October 6 um, is clearly not the case. Having said that, um, as, as, as one observer recently noted, 
um, Israel has managed to destroy everything in the Gaza Strip except Hamas. Um, yes, degraded, weakened, um, has lost uh, men and material and all, and, and all the rest of it. But if you consider um, what Israel's ob stated objectives were, the destruction and eradication of Hamas, well, it's been six months um, and we don't see much of that um, uh, happening. Um, eliminating Hamas's capacities uh, for um, uh, military action and governance hasn't really happened. On the governance side, uh, as we've just been discussing, particularly in the northern uh, Gaza Strip, um, there have been um, uh, significant Israeli achievements in producing uh, chaos and anarchy. But what will happen the day after the Israelis withdraw? On the evidence, um, uh, governance will 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 reemerge and um, uh, impose itself. So, I think um, you know one doesn't have to be uh, a strategic genius um, to recognize that, taken in strictly conventional military terms, um, this has been an absolute Israeli failure. To the extent that one can say that, even if Israel achieves all its stated objectives tomorrow morning. The fact that it's now been half a year in a miniature territory comprising all of 365 square kilometers um, against a militia, um, which is at best a small shadow of either any regular army or um, more powerful uh, uh, forces like um, uh, Hezbollah, that, that speaks to um, uh, real uh, failure. You know, early on, um, there was a question about how long it would take Israel uh, to achieve its uh, objectives and whether Israel would be prepared to invest um, uh, the time and losses and would be given enough leeway by its Western sponsors and allies to achieve those goals. I think now... Um, most people who have seriously looked at this have come to quite a different conclusion, which is not um, that Israel may be unwilling um, to pay the price of achieving its objectives or won't be um, given uh, the room to achieve those objectives, but rather that it seems um, increasingly evident that it is incapable of, uh, of achieving those objectives. At this point, I want to quickly... Um, highlight some of the key developments from last week. Um, the ICJ issued a, another um, report uh, saying that the provisional measures which are issued on 26 January has not been fulfilled by Israel or Israel has failed to abide by those provisional measures and it's added another provisional measure demanding Israel to allow aid to be uh, aid to enter into Gaza unhindered. And um, and that, to me, and also you mentioned the fact that the Security Council last week passed a resolution calling for a ceasefire. The U.S. abstained, uh, which, uh, of course, surprised some and has been condemned by Israel. And that, to me, brings to question an, imp an important issue. All the major multilater multilateral institutions of the world have responded, said something, the ICJ, uh, the various uh, human rights organizations, uh, the Security Council, um, IMF, um, and the various other institutions um, across the world. Um, and yet, we've not seen any movement from the Israeli side. Uh, and, and the question that must be asked is, how long can this go on? Can can Israel simply just ignore all the major multilateral institutions that we have? Um, or can you see other leverages being used? What other leverages can there be? I mean, the Security Council has issued a statement. Uh, the ICJ has issued um, condemnations after condemnations and warned about genocide. Um, what else is there to prevent Israel other than physically taking action against Israel's genocidal campaign in Gaza? Well, it's it's a very good question, and I and I think the simple answer is that Israel will um, continue to cavalierly ignore and disregard any and all such resolutions. 
as long as it is confident that Washington has its back, that the Biden administration um, will ensure that Israel can continue um, to act with impunity. I would note there is one institution that you didn't mention, and that is arguably the one that would make a difference, because unlike um, the International Court of Justice, um, uh, uh, this particular institution can, for example, issue arrest warrants against individuals um, and point to specific crimes for which um, such individuals should stand uh, trial. And that is, is, of course, the International uh, Criminal Court. The International Court of Justice deals with states and is part of the United Nations. The International Criminal Court is not part of the United Nations and deals with crimes committed um, uh, by individuals. The problem here is that its prosecutor, um, uh, Karim Khan of the United Kingdom, um, even though it's now early April, appears to still be on his Christmas holiday, and no one expects um, uh, to hear from him any time within the next um, uh, several years, confirming you know, why Israel and the United States and the United Kingdom so energetically supported um, his candidacy. But um, getting back to the taking the Security Council first, um, on this fourth or fourth attempt to um, uh, adopt a ceasefire resolution, the United States recognizing its growing or increasing increasingly total isolation um, in the world and that has become somewhat of a laughing international laughing stock as well, um, took the decision to abstain on the resolution rather than uh, veto it. And the resolution passed. Immediately thereafter, um, the United States uh, representative to the United Nations, US spokespersons in Washington began explaining, quote unquote, that this is a non-binding resolution, which is absolute nonsense and they know it. Because according to the UN Charter and according to ruling by the International Court of Justice, not only is every United Nations Security Council resolution binding and binding on every member state of the United Nations, um, but all Security Council resolutions are equally binding regardless of how they were um, adopted. And so therefore this resolution is in fact international law. But the US went further. It not only stated that it is um, uh, non-binding, but that it didn't expect Israel to change policy and that it was fine with Israel not changing um, its policy. In other words, consider, con um, continuing with its genocidal aggression. And um, to make, to remove any ambiguity about where the United States stood, later that same day, um, the US government um, basically issued a kosher certificate to Israel's genocide because um, due to pressure from Congress and US legislation, um, the Biden administration had to certify that Israel was using its arsenal of US weaponry um, in a manner consistent with not only international humanitarian law, but also US domestic legislation, and furthermore had to certify that Israel was not using US military aid to hamper the delivery of humanitarian assistance um, to the Gaza Strip. And the US said, you know, this is the best war we've ever seen. Um, Israel is behaving like an angel. Um, and we have absolutely no objection to Israel because, you know, it's um, uh, um, it's doing everything perfectly consistently with um, international law, making itself even more of a laughingstock um, on the global stage. And that even a number of prominent um, U.S. senators reacted with uh, incredulity to this. And then as if that weren't enough, um, uh, there were then um, reports of a new massive Israeli uh, um, uh, supply of U.S. weaponry um, to uh, Israel. And I won't get into that now because that appears to have more to do with Lebanon than the Gaza Strip. The other issue um, concerns the International Court of Justice. Um, what, what actually happened is that South Africa 
once again went back to the court in The Hague. Um, uh, and on the basis of developments since the initial ICJ ruling in January, and particularly um, the incipient famine in the Gaza Strip, asked the court to um, modify or pronounce additional uh, provisional measures. The court looked at the situation and um, determined uh, that the situation was sufficiently urgent um, and sufficiently serious um, that it felt it was required to issue um, uh, additional provisional uh, measures. It did not endorse um, uh, South Africa's um, request for a ceasefire. And interestingly, the only uh, its, its only um, explanation of why it didn't do that is because any ceasefire order it would uh, announce would only oblige states that are um, signatories to the Genocide Convention. And this, of course, um, is, is one of the belligerents in this case is Hamas, which is not a state and therefore not a signatory to the Genocide Convention. So that was the only reason it gave. But very interestingly, seven of the 16 judges, in other words, um, uh, one short of half, issued separate opinions in which they uh, made clear that they felt that despite um, uh, what, what I just said, that the court should nevertheless have also um, called for a um, uh, ceasefire. So picking up on your point about US President Joe Biden uh, issuing a national security memorandum, that memo stipulated that recipients of U.S. weapons must be in compliance with international law, U.S. law, and they mustn't block uh, the, uh, the delivery of humanitarian assistance. Of course, Israel has been accused of that, and um, the consensus seems to be, apart from the U.S., that it is blocking aid and it is also using weapons to carry out human rights abuse. But the U.S. claims that it has assurances that that is not the case. Assurances given by Israel. So, and that and that has meant that delivery of arms has continued unhindered. Uh, and at the same time, we see escalation uh, with Hezbollah in Lebanon. So the question now is: I mean, is there a different purpose to this? Are we now? Are the arms that are being delivered to Israel? Uh, a green light to attack Lebanon, given the U.S. has said that Rafa is a red line. Rafa invasion is not something the U.S. would support. Can we now um, assume that the weapons that are being delivered is really with a war with Hezbollah in mind? I I, I would argue that it does, um, and I would argue that this um, weapons delivery can also be interpreted as a U.S. green light to Israel. Um, to expand its um, uh, war uh, with Lebanon. You know, um, the, the, some of the main elements in this arms deal, F-35 um, fighter jets, um, which are, Israel already has enough of to level the Gaza Strip several times over, um, these massive uh, bombs, um, which won't really be of much use in the Gaza Strip because, uh, you know, so many thousands of them have already uh, uh, been dropped. If, if, if you look at the details of this um, gift of billions of dollars of arms, it seems much more calibrated to launching a massive attack on uh, Lebanon and, and, and perhaps um, uh, Syria and other places as well than for an Israeli uh, ground operation into Rafah, which, as you said, at least formally, uh, the United States uh, has has opposed. So, um, and this also came in the context of a um, of a uh, visit to Washington by the Israeli Defense Minister. And, and the problem here, of course, is you know we really learn need to learn to stop listening to what the Americans say, and instead carefully watch what they do, because that is how you interpret U.S. policy. Um, uh, you know, they make all kinds of, of, of statements throughout the day that are consistently uh, 
contradicted by their actual decisions and actions. So, for example, when the Security Council resolution that we were just discussing passed, um, everyone, uh, many people came out and said, oh, the U.S. is finally supporting a ceasefire. Well, no, because you have to look at what they subsequently did, um, which was to claim this resolution is non-binding because it seems to be official U.S. policy um, that any international resolution that requires Israeli compliance is by definition uh, non-binding. And then they went on to issue a kosher certificate to Israel's genocidal aggression against the Gaza Strip that very same day. They made clear they expected no change in um, Israeli policy. And on top of it, engaged in this massive arms deal. And that contradiction between what Israel, uh, the US, what the US says and what the US does is something that seems it's quite common. There's a pattern there, which we'll get to in, a, in one of our other questions related to um, uh, penalizing uh, settlers. But before we do that, um, we see that the US is more and more isolated on this. The UK government lawyers uh, over the weekend, I think, uh, said that Israel is breaking international law. So this story is related to an ongoing debate within the Tory party um, as to whether they have received any legal advice on on Israel's um, conduct on the Gaza Strip. And the determination of government lawyers is that Israel is in breach of international law. And therefore, certain things should be triggered, one of which is to stop arms sales to Israel. Uh, but the UK has kept, the government has kept that view uh, secret. And it's only through some great journalism that we now know that the UK government has received advice and the advice has been that it is against international law. And one of the senior Tory uh, members who is the chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, a really influential committee within the UK government, uh, so with the Westminster, she went on to speak about this and said that transparency is paramount at this moment, uh, not least to uphold international law and the rules-based order. So transparency has been thrown out the window and we don't know why and how the US has determined you know, that Israel is not violating international law. What are, what are the details of that? There, there seems to be no accounting for how these governments make these decisions, how the US has determined what is determined, how the US and how the UK equally has gone about supporting Israel despite the uh, dis, uh, you know, advice of its lawyers. And it seems like you know, democracy is out the window when it comes to Israel and they're willing to um, they're willing to risk their own legitimacy, risk democracy in their own countries in order to maintain support of Israel. Well, what, what I find interesting about the British case, um, we haven't seen the legal advice, but as you mentioned, everyone um, uh, has come to the conclusion that it does exist and that it's being suppressed uh, by uh, the Foreign Office because, as you said, um, uh, it obliges the UK government um, to take a number of, of steps in response, which it clearly doesn't want to do. But what I find interesting about this case is that it suggests that when you're talking about civil servants, legal advisors, and so on, that these people are actually doing their jobs. And they're actually doing their jobs um, to a high professional standard. And that the problem here is that you're not dealing with um, mendacity in the civil service, but rather you're you're dealing with crookedness, if you will, at the at the level of the political leadership. And I wouldn't at all be surprised to learn that this is also the case in any number of European uh, countries. We know, for example, that in the Netherlands um, it was also the same that. Um, uh, the civil servants who are responsible for monitoring these things and for keeping their political leaders um, uh, informed are doing their job. They're just being ignored 
and their um, uh, memos and 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 opinions, uh, written legal advice, and so on, is just being suppressed by the governments. I'm, I suspect something similar um, may be going on in the United States because. If my memory serves me correctly, we haven't seen the actual document um, that assesses um, Israeli uh, compliance uh, with with uh, U.S. Uh, requirements. We were just told the number of resignations. Sorry, just intro. We have seen a number of resignations. Yeah. There's more. Yeah. Yes. Well, that that too. That to me, once again, you know, it's it's not easy uh, to to resign uh, a job. Um, uh, and it's particularly difficult to resign because you believe that Palestinians are human beings and are entitled to human rights. So, um, uh, you know, for everyone that resigns, I think it's fair to assume there are at least many hundreds who share their views. Um, but again, in, in the U.S. case, it's unclear to me whether um, uh, what we were told about Israeli compliance is actually what those who drafted um, that report uh, stated, or whether this is just the spin we're being uh, given by the U.S. government. But in the U.K., that very clearly um, is the case. And again, um, in the British case, the government is not lying by saying that we received legal advice that confirms um, uh, that Israel is behaving properly. They've basically tried to suppress it um, uh, because they don't want to be in a position of taking the measures uh, that would be required if that legal advice were to be released. I, I have forgotten her name, but we had there was a senior Alicia Kearns, Alicia Kearns, that's it. Yes, yeah. senior State Department uh, staff who resigned last week. Making oh no, the, I thought Alicia Kearns was the. British um, head of the... oh no that's that's that yes so that's the uh, chair of the she didn't resign she's the chair of the Holocaust yes she's the one who made the statement that that's right Foreign Secretary Cameron had received this um, advice release, but, but isn't yeah. released yeah that's right uh, and there was a resignation high profile resignation last week in yes. Washington uh, State Department yeah. official she's making her the second and in many of her interviews she, um, she mentioned that there's a lot of um, disaffected staff that many want to resign but some believe that they can make a difference still remaining within uh, the state department but the discontent and um, the shock and surprise at biden's position on this is quite deep and wide within within u.s um, civil servants right mm -hmm. um so yeah so i think we will see more and more resignation if uh, if that assessment is anything to go by but let's move on to our final uh, question uh, again, returning back to your point about uh, look at what Biden does and not what he says. The U.S. Uh, sent a letter to the Israeli Finance Ministry earlier, saying that the uh, threat against settlers uh, should not require their bank accounts to be closed in Israel. So several major banks had actually. Uh, tried to close the accounts of, I think, seven Israeli settlers who Biden administration had named as those who are being sanctioned. Um, and that came as a response to Finance Minister uh, Basil Smotrich, who said that Biden had taken a you know an extremely draconian measure and he threatened the Biden administration saying that if the US continues with its sanctioning of settlers, uh, it would punish the Palestinian authority or the Palestinian economy. Um, whatever the reason is, I mean, this is just another example of just how toothless uh, the U.S. is when it comes to issuing threats uh, against Israel. Yeah, I, you know, I think the next step is probably that U.S. Secretary of State Blinken will nominate these settlers for the Nobel Peace Prize. It's uh, it's incredible. Um uh, you know, the U.S. Um, took this utterly meaningless um, uh, cosmetic charade of um, uh, announcing that a number of settlers that can be counted on the fingers of an amputated hand um, are no longer welcome in the United States. It would be denied U.S. visas. Um, then, it, um, uh, then it announced sanctions against them. And... What happened is that 
Israeli banks because they don't want to be blacklisted by the United States uh, because, you know, given the importance of the U.S. economy, we've seen the same thing, for example, with Iran sanctions. Um, banks don't like to take risks and expose themselves to potential um, uh, sanctions. So these Israeli banks, without being directly requested by the U.S., if I understand correctly, um, close down the accounts of these um, uh, radical extremist um, uh, settlers. And then, as you mentioned, the Israeli finance minister, who can only be described as a fascist. I mean, there's really no other way to describe this man. Um, basically said to the U.S., which is, of course, um, Israel's the chief reason that Israel exists at all, um, has said that, well, if you do this, we are going to uh, prohibit Israeli banks from dealing with the Palestinian Authority. And so the monthly tax transfers of, of Palestinian tax receipts to the Palestinian Authority and so on would stop. How did the U.S. respond? It backed off. It, it contacted the Israeli banks, say, oh, no, 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 we never intended for you to take the measures that are measures that are automatically taken in cases like this. You know, please. Um, it's, You're it's, overreacting. The US, oh, you, bank, you guys are overreacting. Yes, yes, Why are you closing their yes, accounts down? Yes. Mm. I mean, we're not dealing with Arabs or Muslims here. You know, we're, we're dealing with Israeli Jews. Um, uh, we certainly didn't intend for any consequences. So why are you imposing any consequences? That was basically the message. And again, um, you know, yes, there is contempt um, uh, for the way um, the U.S. Uh, has been uh, dealing with this. But I think more importantly, the U.S. has now become a laughing stock around the world. Um, no, you know, it's impossible to take anything the U.S. does seriously anymore. It's it's um, so beholden um, to this um, uh, genocidal campaign. And it has, in fact, become beholden to the ex to Israel's extreme right, Biden, for all his talk about Golda Meir and the liberal Israel and and whatnot, um, he is standing shoulder to shoulder not only with Netanyahu, um, but with Smotrich and 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 uh, and Ben Gvir. You know, it's it's uh, it. It really, I mean, yes, contempt is entirely ap appropriate, but I think laughing stock is a word that best describes it. I think we should discuss uh, the uh, as our last point: um, the U.S. Um, cancelling funding for UNRWA until twenty twenty five, and at the same okay. time, um, pressuring or imposing on Canada to maintain and continue its support for UNRWA. Uh, what's happening there? So on the one hand, it's cutting funding, and on the other hand, it's um, applying pressure on a friendly state and ally to say, no, you continue funding and provide more funds to UNRWA. It seems to be like it's stuck between two different you know, messages and two different constituencies, uh, which is um, messaging for. Well, the US here again, this is something the US bought upon itself. Um, uh, the day that um, the International Court of Justice on the um, 26th of January issued its initial provisional measures, um, Israel came out with these um, absurd allegations about um, UNRWA and its staff uh, being involved with Hamas and in the October 7th attacks and so on. And the U.S., as it often does in these cases, doesn't act, not only didn't receive any evidence, didn't even ask for any evidence, came out and said, these accusations are highly credible, and immediately, you know, before before anything happened, um, suspended um, um, uh, its uh, funding to UNRWA, which is no small matter because the U.S. is in fact UNRWA's um, uh, largest uh, largest funder. So that happened, and what what happened in the U.S. Congress is is in a way um, only indirectly related to the Palestinians. Um, the Biden administration needed to get a budget through Congress. And as part of the agreement that the White House made with the radical Republicans in Congress, 
it agreed that there would be no further funding of UNRWA until at least 2025. And it additionally agreed um, on all kinds of punitive measures against the Palestinian Authority if the Palestinian Authority um, uh, undertakes any measures um, to seek the assistance of international legal institutions like the International Criminal Court or the International Criminal Justice. Again, don't listen to what they say. Uh, look, at, uh, look at what they do. At the same time, it seems that under the radar, um, the U.S. is sufficiently concerned about UNWA's collapse that it has been quietly uh, advising or appealing to its allies to resume their um, uh, to resume their funding of UNRWA, and in this case, it was uh, Canada. So one either has to accept that the United States is secretly in cahoots with uh, Hamas and is trying to find ways to um, to fund the Hamas front organization known as UNRWA or that the U.S. understands that this entire story was nothing uh, but a hoax and is now seeking to um, encourage its allies to resume their fundings. I should add that when the Trump administration cut funding from UNRWA, and I believe it was 2018, um, and launched this broad-based campaign for the abolition of the entire agency, there are numerous reports that again under the radar informally, US officials went to the Gulf states and asked them to increase their funding um, uh, to UNRWA to make up the shortfall caused by the, by the US and its entirely disingenuous campaign against the agency. Hmm. Well, that's all we have time for. I mean, before we leave, I uh, just want to ask what we should be, what key stories and developments we should be looking for to for next week. I mean, in my case, uh, I'm following the story in the UK, of course, obvious, for obvious reasons. I live here. Uh, but I want to see what if the government will actually disclose the advice and the ramifications of that. Um, I think it will have important ramifications. So I want to wait and see what happens in this regard. I mean, is there anything specific you're looking forward to next week? Well, two issues. Um, keep an eye on the Northern Front, so-called, uh, Lebanon, um, uh, Syria, um, assuming, which I think is a fair assumption, that Israel gets away with its utter destruction of, uh, of the uh, Al-Shifa medical complex, um, one can expect um, something similar to be happening um, in, in uh, Nasser Hospital and uh, Khan Yunus Amal Hospital there, and um, uh, the Al-Aqsa Hospital in, uh, in Deir al-Balah. I'm not anticipating any imminent Israeli massive ground operation in uh, Rafah. And in fact, the way that Netanyahu has been agitating against um, the United States and insisting, um, you know, the world is against us, but we're going to do this, suggests to me that the Israeli military is not that keen to do this um, anytime soon, and that they will hide the government and the military leadership will hide behind the U.S. Uh, rhetorical opposition to it um, as as an excuse to postpone. But who knows? That's that's my impression. Thank you, Moen. That was my guest, Moen Rabbani, and thank you for tuning in. And thank see you, you next week for another episode of Memo Review with me, Nasim Ahmed. Bye-bye.